Hi, this is Kathy Nickham. I'm the DTC Education Director, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our November session. Our topic is on Fabre disease, um, and we'll be hearing about beyond hypertension, Fabre disease and other genetic causes of kidney failure in adults. Um, we have some housekeeping tools um, or thoughts on the, on the first slide here. Your phones are muted. Uh, if you want to ask questions, it'll be uh, important for you to unmute by doing pound six and then mute again by doing star six. Uh, we welcome your questions in the chat room, and Christy will keep an eye on those as they come in or any comments that we get. Uh, we, will have, uh, we will try to have some time for sli uh, some questions at the end of the presentation. Otherwise, we, you can send us your questions, and we'll make sure that we get back with you on those. And we are recording the session, and the recording and the slides will be available on our website. And so we also, at the end of this program, if you are uh, joining us um, on the internet, you will be able to do a feedback form at the end. And those of you who are on your phone only will be sending you a feedback form. We welcome your and value your information to us. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Don Jacob Laney, who I think is one of the most passionate and energetic people that I've met. She's a genetic counselor. She's assistant professor, clinical researcher, program leader in the Emory Lysosomal Storage Disease Center and director of the Genetic Clinical Research Center in the Department of Human Genetics at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. You'd have to have a lot of energy to be doing all that. Her position involves seeing patients living with genetic conditions in clinics, coordinating enzyme replacement therapy and fusion treatments, and coordinating and overseeing several Fabre clinical research trials. The first slide that you see here is my conflict of interest slide. One of the great things about being an expert in a particular set of conditions, in this case uh, diseases that affect the lysosomal storage of their body, uh, is that you get to do cool things and meet lots of people and, and go and sit on boards. So <laughs> I have lots of disclosures, I'm afraid, but all of them I consider uh, tr trying to work with them in a balanced and fair manner. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start it off with a story, because I think sometimes, you know, we talk about uh, as healthcare providers, when you see a patient who has a condition, then you remember that condition forever when we're talking about rare genetic conditions. So I think the same goes for someone who, you know, is not seeing someone in a clinical setting. If you meet somebody, say, in dialysis center who talks about his story and how he got where you, you guys are and what they're thinking about, I think the story is what captures you and helps you remember what's going on and also helps you relate to specific health problems. So in this case, I'm going to tell you the story about a um, – this is actually based on a patient that I know. Uh, when he was about 45 years old, he you know, didn't go to the doctor that often he went when he had a cold or needed the antibiotics. But you know, one day he was feeling a little run down, so he finally went to his doctor and got some blood work. When they looked at it, they were very surprised to see that this very vital man uh, was on uh, the path to chronic kidney disease, or he's having chronic kidney disease issues. And they referred him over to nephrology, to his kidney doctors. And of course, his first question was, why did this happen? How did this happen? I'm a, I'm a, a vital guy. I'm, I'm working and um, doing all the things I need to do. Yeah, I didn't go to the doctor very much, but why would I be in kidney failure? Next slide, please. His nephrologist said, well, we don't know the full answer, but we're going to do some lab work and we're going to try to figure it out. In the meantime, we're going to treat you like we do everybody else who's at your stage of chronic kidney disease. So did lab work, kidney ultrasound, did a measured GFR with IOHEXAL, and they didn't really find a good answer. What they did find is one of his, his uh, lipid levels, so like cholesterol, except this one's a little bit different, was elevated. They thought, well, maybe this caused that problem. But they also found something else, which is that his heart was a little bit larger than you would expect for a man his age. And that particularly was the lower left side of his heart was enlarged and thick. Um, he also, when somebody sat down and asked you know, closely what was going on, he had some things that you couldn't really measure, things that you couldn't draw blood or look in urine and see. So he didn't sweat at all. So it, he overheated really easily in the temperatures of you know, Georgia, where we are. Um, he also had chronic diarrhea that, on, that went three days of diarrhea, three days of constipation, three days of diarrhea, three days of constipation, with never having a normal bowel movement, which, as you might expect, is pretty frustrating. 
And he also had this burning pain that he's had since he was a kid in his hands and his feet, which is very unusual when you're early on. You know, it's something that you might feel later when you're on dialysis. You might feel when you've got complications of diabetes, but you know, he didn't have those things yet. Next slide, please. But as he went on, his kidneys did worsen, the function worsened, and he ended up on hemodialysis. And at that point, the, his nephrologist said, you know, let's, let's take a little look. Let's do a kidney biopsy. And I'm sure several of the folks on the call have been through kidney biopsy, done outpatient in this case, and pretty quickly. But a real surprise came back. They found that in the cells of his kidney, he had these stored lipids called glycosphingolipids. And they look like little zebras. If you look at a, a picture, this is not his kidney cells, but it's a good representative kidney cells with uh, this condition. The GL3 lines up and looks like little zebra cells. And it's called zebra bodies when they look at it under the microscope, the electron microscope. And what those told him that he probably had a cause for his kidney failure and his heart disease and the other symptoms that is genetic, something that runs in the family. And in this case, these zebra bodies are pretty certain that Fabry disease is, is affecting him. Next slide, please. So what is Fabry disease? Some of you on the call may be very familiar with Fabry disease. Some of you may have never heard of Fabry disease. Um, Fabry disease is a condition that is um, inherited through families, although someone can be the first person in their family if they have a gene change. Uh, it's a gene change that's on the X chromosome. So if you think about it, women have two X chromosomes. That's what makes us women. And men have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. And when you have a son and you are a woman, you pass on your X. And if you have a daughter and you're a woman, you pass on your X. So you see there's no difference there. The person who determines if a child is a boy or a girl is the dad. And so if a dad passes, passes on the X and that's a woman, if the dad passes on the Y, then he's, the, the baby will be male. Fabry disease is only on the X chromosome. So it has nothing to do with the Y chromosome or any other um, chromosome that instructs our body how to make our functions and growth. If you think about it, uh, our chromosomes are made up of genes, like beads on a string. And those genes, in fact, in those chromosomes, are what direct our body to function the way that they should. So if you have a gene change on your X chromosome, then that, and if you're a man, then you have no other X chromosome and no other gene that's active. And in that case, you have a um, Fabry disease. If you're a woman and you have a gene change in one of your X's and the other X has no problems, you still have Fabry disease, believe it or not, because one X usually turns off before you're born. And if more than the X's with no change turn off, then you end up having more um, chromosomes and X chromosomes that you know, could cause Fabry disease by not leading to what you need to to grow and develop. It is much more common than we think, and it affects every part of the body. And I'm going to show you some clinical symptoms in the next slide. Next slide, please. When you think about how Fabry disease happens, you have a gene change that we've talked about. When you have a gene change in the X chromosome in a gene we call GLA, you don't make enough of an enzyme. An enzyme is, I like to think of it like scissors. Their job is to cut things down. And in the lysosome, which is in every cell of your body, these scissors, their job, the enzyme, is to break down big, giant molecules. Those big, giant molecules we saw stored up in the kidney cells that cause zebra bodies. If those scissors don't work, and in this case, the scissors are called alpha-galactosidase A, um, if those don't work, then you have this gunk that builds up in the cells. So we talk about GL3 gunk building up in the cells. Next slide, please. That make the cell walls bigger and thicker. And then the inside, the, what we call the lumen, or the hole that goes down the middle of the blood vessels and all your cells is smaller. The smaller your blood vessels, the more likely it is you're going to have problems. And then it doesn't just build up in your blood vessels. It builds up in nerves and all other parts of the body. So Fabry disease causes narrow blood vessels, which then causes um, irritation within the cells, and that causes problems throughout the body. Next, help, next slide, please. So typically, when we talk about classic Fabry disease, because of this storage of gunk in the cell, because of the narrow blood vessels, in childhood, you get just what our guy was experiencing, periods of intense pain, uh, radiating through the bodies with fevers, daily having burning, tingling pain in the hands and feet, not sweating, overheating easily, and often that comes with depression. As they get older, more problems, starting to have some protein in the urine, 
really having a lot of fatigue and, and very tiredness. And as time goes on, um, more issues as you go into adulthood with kidney failure, heart attacks, and strokes. Next slide, please. So when you look at someone with Fabry disease, many people with Fabry disease have what we call angiokeratomas. Those are these purple freckle-like things you see around at the belly button, <laughs> just for perspective. Um, these angiokeratomas are these little purplish, reddish purple dots. can either be isolated all by themselves, but it's looking like freckles, or they can be a bunch of them around the genital area, around the, the belly, or even on the fingers or inside the lip on the skin. One sign also of Fabry disease that is really easy to see and happens to be there a lot in Fabry disease is this corneal whorl. If you look at this picture of the eye, you see the pretty star pattern that's in the back of that eye. Not the, the bright white lots, but if you see this, almost the light stripes, it looks like a, a um, starburst coming from the back of the eye. That doesn't affect the vision much. It may decrease uh, night vision a little bit, but when an eye doctor at your Walmart, at your local eye center, at Pearl Vision, puts that light up, that light that's like a narrow slit called a slit lamp exam, they can see this corneal whorl. And anybody who has a corneal whorl on the, their slit lamp exam, it's really important they get tested for Fabry disease. They may not have it. There's some medications that cause this as well, but it's a pretty good indication. And as you've seen, Fabry disease impacts life a lot, so it's really important to hear what's going on. The other thing we know is that storage of gunk, that GL3 in the cells of the body, starts before birth. But the final damage is not done right away. Damage is progressive. The gunk builds up, then it causes all those things we talked about, inflammation and health problems. But if you start treatment early, the hope is that you're going to derail all those problems and stop people who start therapy early from having kidney failure and heart attacks and strokes. Now, therapy, uh, there is a treatment approved, and it's something we try to start as soon as possible. It's called Fabrazyme. And Fabrazyme is a medication that was FDA approved in April 20, 2003. And so we don't have um, data that goes for 30 years. It's not like other medications where we have so much data on so many people. We do know, next slide please, um, that the reason that this got approved is that before treatment you have these zebra bodies built up in your cells and after treatment there's less. Now does that mean that someone with Fabry disease who already has kidney disease is going to totally avoid kidney failure? That does not mean that, unfortunately. What it does mean is hopefully that we'll keep those kidneys as stable as possible, thus keeping the thought of dialysis or kidney transplant far away as we can. Um, classic Fabry disease, the traditional time for men to have kidney failure in many of the women was around age 40. Um, now, you can get kidney transplants, and that works really well for most of the patients. Um, however, if we could avoid dialysis and kidney failure, even pushing it out to 60s and 70s. That would be a lot better long-term than in the 40s. Next slide, please. Now, remember that picture I showed you that showed how everybody's born with, or everybody with Fabry disease is born with that gunk in the cells, but it builds up over time until it causes damage? We do have one person out there who's done some great research on boys with Fabry disease when they're younger, and she has found that if you start therapy, you know, younger, in this case a very small study that found a seven-year-old boy and a teenager and started therapy every other week at a dose of one milligram per kilogram, then they cleared out the deep kidney cells and they cleared out the, the uh, more surface kidney cells, so the podocytes and the epithelial cells in the kidneys cleared out. That is the first proof that we had, and this has been several years since the study, but uh, that's the first proof we had that the earlier start therapy, the better it is. And our hope is that if we can find more and more younger kids with Fabry disease and start them on therapy, that it's not going to be maintaining and keeping them from having kidney disease and pushing it out, that we could actually stop that from happening. That's our hope. <laughs> you know, that's all you can start with. Okay, so what does it mean for a guy that I talked to you about? Well, at first he was very excited. He finally had an answer. Why does his kidneys start having problems when he was in his 40s? And also it helps his doctors come up with a care plan. Why did he have this, these heart problems with his kidney problems? Oh, well, it's because it's Fabry disease. Okay. Well, if he starts enzyme replacement therapy, the hope is that his kidneys um, may fail over time. But, we, you know, they have failed. He's on dialysis. But the hope is that um, his heart would get improved as well. So, but then he thought, well, who else could this affect? Now, for his family, it starts the same way. 
first step is, oh, good, an answer. That's wonderful. But the next question is, what does that mean? What does that mean for everybody within his families? And, and he had several children. Next slide, please. Um, looking at his family, the next question was, okay, who could have this disease too? We know that women with Fabry disease are unique because they can have symptoms as severe as a man or they could have much milder symptoms. In fact, some women um, don't report symptoms until much later in life. So it's a little bit different than the path that a man has with Fabry disease, but again, it could be just the same path. So it's a little, a little bit more complicated in this situation, but that's okay. But when our man took a look at his family, he said, well, how do I know who else might have Fabry disease? And I said, well, the first thing we look at is the family history of Fabry disease. And since we had diagnosed him with Fabry disease, everybody related to him suddenly was moved to an increased at-risk category. From then, we look for symptoms that are more common. So do they, did family members who didn't sweat or had decreased sweating or really had a problem getting hot, people who had burning pain in their hands and feet, people who had those purple skin rash we just looked at, people who had those corneal whorls, which is what those stars in the eyes and the back looked like, or people who um, you know, had kidney failure, of course. And this is how we think about looking at family members or anybody else out there who could possibly be interested in figuring out if they could be at risk for Fabry disease. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot. This is not as actually a family history, but it's, a, it's kind of what it would look like. So if he looked at his family history, he said, oh my gosh, look at this. I, you know, I never put it together that my mom passed away from a stroke at 55, or my sister, who's much older, passed away at age 50, and she had heart disease, but she also had some protein in her urine, and they just blamed it on her high blood pressure. But I do have a nephew, and, his, and my nephew doesn't sweat just like I never sweat. And he has protein in his urine, and he's only in his 20s. He also has these pains that I had. And I just thought that was kind of normal for my family because my grandson has started having them too. So when you look at this family history and looking at those rules we were just looking at, you can see how the chance to have Fabry disease running in the family when you find one person is greatly increased. In fact, I did a study that if you find one person with Fabry disease in the family, it increases your risk for five other family members to be affected. In this family, you can see there were more than that. And I'm going to run through real quick how it runs in the family so you have a better idea of why he was looking at having three affected daughters and one affected son. I mentioned earlier on, and it may have been too dense at that point, but <laughs> not you but me, putting too much information in there. Um, when you're a man, you have one X and one Y. If you have Fabry disease, the only X you have has Fabry disease on it. So the gene change that causes Fabry disease is sitting right there on that X, and if you have a daughter, your only option is to pass on that X that has Fabry disease. So in this case, the daughters of any man with Fabry disease will also have Fabry disease. And then the mother, she's passing on one X the other. In this case, she doesn't have Fabry disease, so that wouldn't affect it. However, any son of a man with Fabry disease is not at risk for Fabry disease because the Y is not affected by Fabry disease, and that's the only way he can make a boy is by passing on his Y chromosome. Next slide, please. Just to make it more complicated, though, if you're a woman with Fabry disease, in this case, that we, you'll see heterozygote put here, um, it's 50-50. 50% chance that she passes on the X that has the gene change that causes Fabry disease, and 50% chance she passes on the X that doesn't. In this case, because women don't determine sex, it's either one, one X or the other. So gender doesn't matter so much. 50% chance of having a daughter or a son with Fabry disease, 50% chance of having one who's not um, daughter or son. Next slide, please. So I just took you on a little journey through Fabry disease, and I wanted to take a step back and say, well, how should you think about someone who might have Fabry disease or who might have a genetic cause for their kidney disease? If we look at the risks for having kidney disease, the, the most high-risk groups are those with diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, or autoimmune disease. And as you know, people who have kidney failure who don't have any of those things. But one that really increases your chance for kidney failure is having a family history. Next slide, please. And there are different ways that you could have chronic kidney disease, and it could be related to the genes. Um, but when we're looking here, things that might think you'll make you think a little bit more about a genetic cause for your kidney failure would be having early kidney failure 
um, which we would count as under 50. I don't consider 50 that particularly old, mind you, but when we have to make a cutoff of what is considered early or later, we usually use 50 or 40. People who don't sweat. People who, when they have the ultrasound of the kidney, which happens a lot when you're um, starting to have chronic kidney disease work up, if you've got lots of cysts in your kidney. If on top of having kidney problems, you've got hearing problems that are getting worse, heart disease that's getting worse, or vision loss. And if you have multiple family members with renal disease. Or if there just seems to be no good reason that your kidneys um, are having issues and beginning to move on the end-stage renal disease path. Those are little clues that tells you you might want to think about or open a conversation with your doctor about, hey, is there some chance that I could have a genetic reason for this kidney problems as well as what else is going on? Next slide, please. Now, even if you have those features I just mentioned, it doesn't mean you've got a genetic condition that runs in the family like Fabry disease. It could be that you have one gene change that combined with environmental factors puts you at increased risk. That's a little effect that could cause chronic kidney disease. Or you could have exposures that happen to you personally through your life or your family plus some genetic changes and combined together, it ended up in your chronic kidney disease. In this case, what I'm talking about today is mostly focusing on genetic conditions that are caused by one serious gene change, like Fabry disease and the other ones I'm talking about. Um, those are ones that run in a specific pattern in the family, and those are the ones that we can test family members and have a better chance of predicting whether or not they might as well uh, have chronic kidney disease, and if there's anything we can do to decrease that chance. Next slide, please. Next one. Sorry, my circle is, is long. Two other fairly common conditions that uh, involve chronic kidney disease that you may have heard about. One of them is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, and the other is Alport disease. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you a little sampling of how these conditions um, occur, how they run in families, and what other signs you might look for to think if you have something like this. Polycystic kidney disease, um, the main feature that, that um, nephrologists will often find is when they do that ultrasound in the kidney, they see lots of fluid-filled cysts in the kidney. And it makes the kidneys bigger, and it makes them not function as well, but those cysts tend to be pretty visible. And that's the first clue that someone could have polycystic kidney disease. There are forms that are more severe that, that affect um, children and babies, but in this case, I'm mostly focusing on the ones that affect adults. So we call that autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. It's a progressive condition, and it affects about 1,000 in individuals. You were fine. Next slide, please. When we talk about the first signs, they're really nonspecific things you could really miss uh, or just blame on everything else, but, you know, going through your normal daily life and stress. But first signs would be really tired, um, high blood pressure, blood in the urine, reoccurring urinary tract infections, or a pain or a heaviness feeling in the back and the abdomen. Most times symptoms do onset between 30 and 40 years, but it could start much earlier, just depending on the gene change and how it's running in a particular family. And the chance that we give for end-stage renal disease is 50% by age 60. Now that means 50% of the people with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease will not be in end-stage renal disease by year 60, but you know we, we're looking at the side of those who are actually already on um, having kidney issues. Next slide, please. As opposed to Fabry disease, where there's one gene that, if it's changed, causes Fabry disease, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease uh, has two genes that can cause issues. So if we're doing testing, we'd look at these two different genes. One gene, it's a very large gene, has the majority of individuals with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. The other gene's a little bit smaller, but still accounts for about 15%. And the difference with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is having just one gene change in one of your genes is enough to cause the symptoms and health problems of the condition. Next slide, please. And autosomal dominant, this is one of those situations where whether you're a man or a woman does not matter, unlike Fabry disease. In this case, the dad has the condition and has a gene change that causes autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. In this case, the chance is 50-50 to have children who have inherited that gene that doesn't work, whether it's in um, PKD1 or PKD2, and half the time it doesn't pass on. He puts on the gene that does not have the mutation and doesn't cause the symptoms of polycystic kidney disease. So it's interesting because this is 50-50. Gender doesn't matter. Boys or girl doesn't matter. It just depends on if you pass on that gene or not. In this case, mom didn't have the condition. 
So moving on to Alport syndrome. Alport syndrome, like polycystic kidney disease and Fabry disease, they're progressive conditions. They affect the whole body. And in Alport syndrome, you not only see chronic kidney disease, but you see eye abnormalities of the lens, and you see hearing loss. So you see how the eye doctor is very useful in helping us figure out if somebody has a genetic cause for their polycystic kidney disease. It shows up in about 1 in 5,000 people. Next slide, please. Much like other genetic conditions we've been talking about, one of the first symptoms for Alport can be blood in the urine. What is a little bit more unusual is you can see hearing loss earlier in life, whether in childhood or adolescence. But again, that can be very dependent on what gene change you have. And you can see these eye findings that we were looking at on the other slide called anterior lenticonus. Next slide, please. There are even more genes and ways that Alport syndrome can run in the family. And I don't show you this to confuse you or um, make you worried about a particular thing, but we talked about X-linked inheritance with Fabry disease already. And we talked about autosomal dominant inheritance with polycystic kidney disease. But I wanted to introduce you to autosomal recessive inheritance because Alport syndrome can run in families in different patterns, those that look like ones we've already looked at, and then this autosomal recessive one. Next slide, please. Um, Autosomal recessive inheritance, I like to call it takes two to tango. In autosomal recessive inheritance disease, both parents have to have the gene change that causes Alport syndrome, but one gene change that works is enough that they don't have any signs or symptoms of Alport syndrome. However, if both parents have the gene change that causes the problem and leaves the symptoms of Fabry disease, or sorry, of Alport syndrome, and both pass it on, then that child 25% of the time would have the condition. So mom and dad don't have any kidney problems, no eye problems, no hearing problems. When they come together and they don't know that they're passing on these genes, 25% of the time they both pass on the gene of the problems, both pass it on, and that child will have Alport syndrome. But 75% of the time they'd pass on some mix of the genes that work and don't work or have the change or don't have the change, and they would not have Alport syndrome. This is autosomal recessive. Both parents have to have it both have to pass it on. But by have it, I mean be unaffected carriers. You'll see 25% of the time, um, the child would get both copies of the gene that works fine, has no changes, and then 50% they'd be carriers, just like the parents. No Alport syndrome, but do have the potential if they found somebody else who has that gene change and passed it on to have a child with Alport syndrome. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I've ran through three different causes uh, genetic causes of, of uh, chronic kidney disease that could lead to renal failure. And talk with you a little about the little symptoms that can go around it that give you clues that maybe someone's kidney disease is caused by a genetic condition that runs in families. Your question might be, okay, that's great, Dawn. Why do I want to know this? How is this informational use for, for me? My kidney is already failed. How are you going to help me? Well, one thing you may have already guessed based on the family history if you know that somebody has a genetic cause for their chronic kidney disease, then you can test their family members and hopefully you can get them treatments that are going to either decrease the time to chronic kidney disease or hopefully, fingers crossed, with time and good treatments, eliminate that chance. Also, if we have that, it helps the person themselves. If you are on dialysis or you're in renal failure and getting a transplant and you've got a genetic condition, Having a diagnosis tells us what else we should be looking for. As you know, when you go through a transplant evaluation, they're looking for anything else that might be a problem that they need to address. And they want to make sure that you're going to be as healthy as possible when you get that kidney. So if you know you've got a genetic condition and you know the things you're watching very closely and you can treat them earlier, not just from a symptomatic treatment that starts and addresses the change that's causing the problems from the gene, but really looking at you from head to toe and getting you the best care plan you could possibly get. It's going to increase your quality of life. It's going to increase the um, healthiness of any kidney you were to get, and it's going to make you overall have a better um, sense of well-being for that because you've got an answer, an answer for why these things are happening to you. Not a broader metaphysical answer, I'm afraid. Like, I can't tell you why it had to happen that way, but I can tell you if we can find an answer for why it specifically happened mechanically in your body, sometimes that helps a lot. Because a lot of people go from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to figure out why, in addition to kidney failure, they've got heart problems, 
or why they're having this horrible GI issues in addition to this kidney problem. And you spend a lot of time and a lot of energy that, let's face it, when you're on dialysis, you may not have. Um, and this takes away that journey. The other thing that is really, really important as you look at having a genetic condition is that often when someone needs a kidney donor, the first place you look because you're trying to get a good match is your family. If you've got a genetic condition running in your family and someone who has a genetic condition but you didn't know it gives you a kidney, it's not going to help the person getting the kidney and it's going to hurt the person giving away the kidney. So this is one of those situations where it has happened. You know, a, a um, brother has given a kidney to his other brother and then it turns out they both have Fabry disease. Um, there's a couple of cases that have been out there in, in um, the scientific articles and things. And that's what we want to avoid. Next slide, please. So what do you do? What if you're listening to me tell you about all these conditions and you go, holy cow, I've got that corneal whirl. My doctor said it didn't affect my vision, so we didn't have to worry about it. Well, the first thing you do is open up the conversation with your doctor, whichever doctor you feel the most comfortable with, and say, hey, doctor who likes to listen to me, <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe I might have a genetic condition. Is there a chance that you would think that I have a genetic underlying cause for my kidney disease? Your doctor might say, I don't know. I'm going to refer you to genetics. Or your doctor might say, I don't know why you would think that opposed to something else. Uh, we think it's your hypertension. But if you really feel that this is a possibility for you, then you can push a little bit and say, hey, I heard about this thing called Fabry disease, and it kind of fits what's going on with me. Would you mind looking at it a little bit? And then we can talk about it some more. Because you want your doctor to walk through this journey with you. Because when you come back with results, you are going to want them to work with you on your care plan. So, um, As you know, some doctors are those that are um, patient-focused and really want to listen and figure out what's going on. Others are more about you know, taking care of the thing that's most important that needs to get done. So you want to take a second and figure out which doctor in your life would be best to approach. Um, the other thing you might talk to is your eye doctor, because eye doctors can see several, several of these symptoms and several things in the eyes that could be related to other things. They like to say that the eyes are the body to the, to the soul and also to the rest of the body. So if you have an eye doctor who can take a look and you could say, hey, I'm kind of thinking about this. Is there any chance you see whirl or haze that could go along with this genetic condition? And, there's, and eye doctors really enjoy looking for puzzles in most cases. And they might be really excited about helping you try to figure this out. The other thing is I would say reach out to genetic disease support groups. In this case, I mistakenly have only a Fabry expert on there, but any of these conditions. The genetic support groups are filled with people who've been through a journey, who've had medical problems, who've tried to get a diagnosis, all those different phases. And they can help you think about and say, gosh, no, this doesn't sound like you at all. Or, hey, I think you really need to get tested. And here's a great person in my area you might talk to. Also very um, helpful, not just tooting my own discipline's horn, but genetic counselors are basically designed to help you figure out if you're at risk for a genetic condition and how to get tested. Next slide, please. Because once you have an increased chance or it appears you could have a genetic condition, the next thing you do is get tested. Now, testing itself is pretty darn easy. You get one tube of blood or you spit in a tube that's specially designed to have saliva in it, and you send it off to the lab, and they'll do usually a molecular genetic test, which is just a fancy way of saying it's going to read through the spelling of your genes and see if there are changes that could explain your issues. And our regular spell check is called sequencing, and we read through the sequencing. But sometimes when you're, for example, reading through a book, like you would think about sequencing, if a page is missing, you may not notice. You may just think that author didn't do a good job of transitioning from one scene to another. Same thing with gene tests. When you are going through your gene tests and you see a large piece added or missing, um, you may miss it on the standard test. So there's a second layer of tests called a deletion duplication test that looks for big chunks that are added or missing to genes. So those tests work together. Um, and, and one thing you need to know before you have molecular testing is it's good to sit down with a professional, either a geneticist, a genetic counselor, who can run you through uh, the impact on, for example, life insurance and long-term health insurance if you do get diagnosed with a genetic condition, and also how your insurance will cover or not cover a particular genetic test. Because some of these tests can be pricey, and sometimes there's patient assistance programs, and sometimes there's free testing, and sometimes there's not. So you really want to know what the out-of-pocket might be before you get a genetic test. Next slide, please. 
This just shows a particular pathway. There's another type of testing called biochemical testing. And biochemical testing um, really has an impact if you've got something, a metabolic condition or a difference in the way that your body um, forms and, and works. In this case, I'm using Fabry disease as an example. Because if you're a woman with uh, at risk for Fabry disease, the testing needs to be done a little bit differently than if you're a man. A man, we can measure that enzyme that I originally talked about, those scissors. We can just see if it's low or high or normal. And that'll give us a much better clue if someone has Fabry disease. For women, because we have those two Xs, the amount of the enzyme in the blood can be normal and still have a woman who has serious symptoms. So what we have to do with women is we start by reading through the gene. Or if we know there's a gene in the family, we start right there. For men, we start with a, a biochemical test, which just looks at the level of that enzyme in the body. And then we go and find the mutations. So that tells us more about how Fabry might affect them. And this is just an example. In every genetic disease, they tend to have one of these pathways that tells your doctor to know exactly how to test you and exactly what the best path is. So that a woman, if she ends up with normal levels of enzyme, doesn't think that she doesn't have Fabry disease because the levels were normal. Next slide, please. Genetic counselors I cannot talk well enough about. We just had Genetic Counselor Awareness Day last week. People don't know that genetic counselors exist. Um, and that's because you don't run into them very much. Unless you are at risk for a genetic condition, have a pregnancy at risk for a genetic condition, have cancer that has an increased chance to run in the family, that's when you meet a genetic counselor. But you can always access a genetic counselor, and there's a great registry. And these are folks who can walk through what's been going on in your life and tell you, hey, this really is something you might think more about, or, huh, from your situation, I think that you maybe need to have a, you know, a stronger appointment. I'm not sure this is necessarily what's going on with you, but it's worth discussing. Next slide, please. And then, as I mentioned, support and advocacy groups are a huge resource and so helpful, from the dialysis patients and citizens, which you guys would all be thinking about here, to genetic disease-specific groups. Um, and as I mentioned, these can be great resources for anything, any question, any real life issue you're having about thinking about whether or not you have a genetic condition or actually once you have been diagnosed with a genetic condition. And I just put a sampling up here. Next slide, please. There's also some resources online that can help you as the patient or the consumer try to figure out more about each condition and whether or not that sounds like you. Um, I am a co-founder of, of a website called thinkgenetic.com, and we've really worked hard to try to figure out practical answers and next steps for people who might be at risk for a genetic condition or have one. NORD has an amazing, extensive um, field of information about different genetic conditions and just rare conditions that are not genetic. And Genetic Alliance has a lot of publications that help you talk to your doctor, think about family members, and really navigate the world of possibly having a genetic condition and then after you're diagnosed. Next slide, please. So with that, I will take any questions that you have. Um, I'd be happy to clarify any points that I moved a little bit quickly through um, or anything else you guys would like to discuss. Reminder, if you do have questions, um, <coughs> excuse me, if you push pound six, that should unmute your phone line. Or if you're online, feel free to type them in the chat, and I can read those out. Um, but Don, do you happen to know how many, I guess, in the spectrum of kidney diseases, uh, or of kidney disease cases, uh, they happen to be genetic as opposed to those, um, I guess, common causes that I know I hear about more, like diabetes or hypertension? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. When I was putting this talk together, I looked for that number because I thought that would be a really useful number to have. The only number that's published and pretty robust and strong is the number of people who have another family member who also has kidney disease. And I think we can use that as a clue, but not a definitive. Uh, we know that with polycystic kidney disease, I believe 5% of the population of people with end-stage renal disease have polycystic kidney disease. So we can extrapolate from that that you know it's under 10%. But still, if it's your family and you're the one being impacted and you fall within that you know, under 10% but higher than 5%, it makes a huge difference. And this, is, this is Kathy. I just want to thank you for the talk. And uh, I really enjoyed the way you presented the genetics. It was like easy to understand. So. Um, thank you for the way you explained how genetics plays a part in, uh, in the diseases you were talking about today. Thank you, Kathy. I think that genetics sounds scary from the outside, and when you just look at a gobbledygook of 
you know, numbers and letters and, and names, these names of all these doctors from the past. But I think when you break it down and you look at a family history and you say, look, my dad has this, I have this, my son has this, you can think, oh, it makes more sense then. And when I was back in genetic counseling school and I was trying to figure out degree of relationship, which is if you're a first degree or a second degree or a third degree, I would always draw out my family history and be like, okay, my dad's sister's son is my cousin Michael, and he's my first cousin. And that way, anytime I drew a pedigree, I could just think, okay, this is how Michael and I are related. Or I think about, oh, this is Michael's son compared to me as a first degree once removed. So <laughs> I try to do that with genetics itself because I remember back to the days when it wasn't so clear to me and try to keep it, mm, you know, keep it down to a level that makes sense for everybody because if we have the basic building blocks of genetics, then we can talk about more complicated things. And then when people talk to their doctors, they have a better basis of saying, look, my mom had kidney failure and she didn't hear well. I am getting hearing loss and my kidneys have failed. And my brother has got kidney disease. Then you can say, look, I know that things run in families in these patterns. Can you help me out? So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And, and they do not automatically um, check people who have kidney disease for the genetic component? Very true. In fact, often they don't even do a kidney biopsy if you're at end-stage renal disease and need a kidney. They'll just pop another kidney in there. Mind you, they do a whole evaluation, but they don't always do a biopsy of what we call the native kidney. They'll do biopsies on the kidney after you get a transplant. Um, but it's just because there's so many different ways you can have renal failure, they don't. We've done a couple different programs at Emory, and there's other institutions that have done it as well, that when someone comes in for their first transplant evaluation, we ask everybody to get a tube of blood taken, and we test for a couple of genetic conditions. And uh, we found a couple with Fabry disease. Now, mind you, one of those I already knew about <laughs> because it was one of my patients. But it shows that the system works. And it wouldn't be that hard to add it on. The problem is just making sure that you're pre-certifying it so that people don't get charged for tests. But in the case of safety, when you're talking about donors and families and genetic diseases that run in them, it's important. And I think that as we move along and have more personalized medicine and we have cheaper and cheaper testing and more broad testing, I think we're going to see more of that during the kidney transplant process. And that sounds like it'll be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, as long as we can figure them out. Yeah, that's Genetics that way is a little bit harder to figure out sometimes. <laughs> right. The bigger the test, the harder to figure out. Are there any other questions for Don? Well, thank you guys all for your attention, and I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about genetic causes of chronic kidney disease. And thank you, Don. We definitely appreciate your um, participating and sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, this session will be recorded. For those of you that want to go back and listen to it again or have your family members listen to it. And I hope that everyone will join us next month um, on December the 7th for our next webinar, which will be on Clinical Research 101, Participating in a Trial. So we hope to see you there as well. Thank you, everyone, for your time and for your participation. And thank you again, Don. Thank you.